Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 330th episode, hey, we made it through another 10. <laughs> All right. Nice round number. <laughs> yeah. We have a bunch of news, including an awesome new ankylosaur. It is such a good find. It might be the best find of 2020 or 2021. Wow. We didn't really have much in the way of ankylosaurs last year, but this one is so cool. It's actually, it was found like 50 years ago. It's a, it's a whole story. But anyway, I'll get into that later. Sabrina also has a bunch of news. About museums and different dinosaur things going on in those museums. Nice. And you have dinosaur of the day, Sinusinasis. Yes, lots of good stuff. But before we get into all of that, as always, we want to thank some of our patrons because we could not make this podcast without them. And this week, we'd like to thank Chris Rohan, Brendan Kavanaugh, Laurasaurus, Ayumi, TRX Dinosaurs, Gabe, Pipaceratops, Taya, and Jurassic Jim. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. We appreciate all of your support. It's truly how we keep this podcast going week to week. And we're excited to share all the dinosaur news with you, too. Definitely. So if you want to join our growing community and chat with fellow dinosaur enthusiasts on Discord and get a whole bunch of other perks, then check out our page at patreon.com slash I know dino. So jumping into the news, we're going to start off with the new ankylosaur because it is so great that you got to start with it. It's I guess. So cool. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's because we usually start with the peer-reviewed journal articles as well. Well, yeah, there's that too. But this is, is totally worth it. Mm. It was written by Jin Young Park and others and published in Scientific Reports. And it is a really cool new ankylosaur that was found in Mongolia. And ankylosaurs are usually defined based on their skulls, just like ceratopsians. You know, if you just have a couple bones from a triceratops, unless you can see those three horns, mm -hmm. <laughs> you're not going to know what it is. Same story with ankylosaurs. It's the heads and the different bumps and things growing out of the backs and sides of the skulls that tell you what species it is. And just like with ceratopsians, a lot of times that's what you find. You don't always find a lot of the body. So even though this find is amazing, they didn't find the skull. Oh. So we can't name it. It's basically the new standard. Is Oh, interesting. Victoria Arbor has been going back and doing this a bunch where things that weren't considered a valid genus or we didn't think we had enough of them where we only had the skull. She's been naming mm -hmm. a little bit here and there over the years. And then things that are only known from postcranial remains are getting, you know, axed. Because it's like we're, we want to compare everything to a standard. Yeah. And so if you always have the skull and you can always compare skulls, that's what we do with ankylosaurus. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. And it's why when I'm always harping about like, oh, you just found a tooth or you just found this one bone from a foot, that's not enough to name a dinosaur because like you have to have a standard thing to compare to mm -hmm. or at least a few bones in most cases. But anyway, ankylosaurs are pretty well put together, thanks largely to Victoria Arbor. This one, since it doesn't have a new fancy name, it's called MPCD100. 1359. <laughs> All right. Not a catchy name. I What's MPC? It's the Mongolian Paleontological Center, which is, I think, affiliated with their main uh, natural history museum mm. in Ulaanbaatar. But it doesn't have any kind of catchy nickname or anything, unfortunately. It'd be nice if it at least had a nickname, but it, it wouldn't be in the Scientific Journal article anyway, most likely. Mm -hmm. So maybe it does, and I just couldn't find it. Originally, MPCD 11359 was discovered in the early 1970s. We don't even know exactly what year it was by the Joint Soviet Mongolian Paleontological Expedition Team. Oh, they found a lot of things. They did. Yeah, they really got going in Mongolia. But unfortunately, when it came time to dig out this individual, they ran out of material oh. and it was really big and difficult. They wanted to excavate it as a huge block. And I guess they didn't have enough material for that. So they covered it in a wood crate, intending to come back later, mm -hmm. and didn't. <laughs> mm. And then meanwhile, it's open to erosion. Well, it was covered in a crate. And I think it was covered in a crate like on all sides. Although in 1999, the dinosaurs of the Gobi expedition documented the condition of it. Mm -hmm. And they said there was a crate around the sides and then the top was covered in loose boards. Oh, okay. So 
I think I'm, it would be weird if they built a crate around the sides and just slapped some loose boards on top. I'm guessing it was originally a crate mm-hmm. covering the whole thing, which might have been enough. I mean, it doesn't rain much in this area, and so it's mostly protecting against wind and um, sand blowing erosion type stuff. So it seems to have worked reasonably well. They said that the since the crate was intact around the sides and it had the boards on the top, it was mostly just filled in with like loose sand that had blown in. So I think it worked pretty well. I mean, for 30 years, and it, there's still something left at least. Mm-hmm. And from what I could tell too, they basically just excavated down to a series of ribs and they discovered, okay, there's all these ribs. And then they started digging down around the sides because they realized there's a whole bunch of dinosaur under those ribs. Right. And then they realized, oh, we can't actually dig this out right now. Yeah. So even if it was weathering, it would have just been the tops of those ribs that was weathering away, whereas the rest of the skeleton was still in the rock. So it wasn't really exposed all that much. Then it took until 2008 when a team from the Korea-Mongolia International Dinosaur Expedition returned and excavated it. So they knew it was there? They knew to look for it? Yeah, I think from what I gather, in the 70s, there were notes about where it was, but it was kind of forgotten about. And then these people in 1999 stumbled onto it and were like, oh, this is kind of important. Mm -hmm. And then it took another 10 years for somebody to actually make it out there. It's not an easy place to go to. It's not like, oh, we know that's there. I'll just go dig it out. Yeah. It's in the middle of the Gobi Desert. It's like, it's a difficult, and it's a really large block because this is most of the body of an ankylosaur that they're digging out. And they want to take it out in one piece Mm -hmm. because it's pretty much articulated. So... It's it's not something that you can just do in a, a regular vehicle. You know, no. <laughs> you need some serious equipment and a lot of people there mm-hmm. in order to get this thing out. They didn't give really any details about how getting it out went, but I presume knowing how Im- extracting large blocks of dinosaurs go. Mm-hmm. Especially it, in remote areas. Yeah, I'm, I can imagine <laughs> what it was like. They probably got creative. Yes, for sure. It definitely weighed tons. I don't know how many tons it weighed, but I would guess at least a couple tons. When they got it back to the lab and they prepared it, they I don't think they fully prepared everything out of it because they did mention in a couple of spots, like we only know what this side of the bone looks like. And I presume that's because the other side is still encased in rock. Mm-hmm. Also kind of like Zool that way. Yes, it's a lot like Zool in a lot of ways, I would say, mm. because... It's beautiful, and it's a lot of the body. But unfortunately, Zool, we have the head, and we also have the tail. Mm -hmm. In this case, we don't have the tail or the head. It's just the middle part. But you know from the middle part that it's an ankylosaur. Oh, yeah. So there's a lot of details that that help us know it's an ankylosaur, and specifically an ankylosaurid. Mm -hmm. So we think that if there was the tail there, it would have a big club at the end of it. Nice. Yeah, it's cool. What we did find... Or they did find, I should say. Mm -hmm. I would like to take some credit for it because I like it so much, but I had nothing to do with it. We the world. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. Humanity found. We got 12 back vertebrae, including 24 matching ribs. So like our backs, there's, you know, two ribs sticking out of each vertebrae. And every single vertebra has that pair of ribs associated with it. Mm -hmm. So it's really great in terms of that part of the body. It also has... The forelimbs and the hind limbs, as well as part of the hips, some other miscellaneous parts like shoulders, and free osteoderms, as they describe them. But they're really mostly in situ, like around the sides of it, so you can see where they were when the animal was alive. Mm -hmm. It also had ossified tendons along the vertebrae, so we can tell that it had a pretty stiff back. But like I said, even with all that, we couldn't determine a genus. We can tell it's an ankylosaurid, though, because it has a broad humerus, the upper arm bone or four leg bone mm-hmm. <laughs> in this case because they're quadrupedal. Shows you that it's an ankylosaurid. It also has wide claws, like wider than they are long, and it has three-toed feet, which is common among a lot of different ankylosaurs. And dinosaurs. Yeah, that's true. But ornithischians, not always. Some of them have more toes. Mm-hmm. It was found in the Barun Goyat formation, one that we talk about. A fair amount, but I'd say it's maybe in third or fourth place among Mongolian formations. It's roughly 75 million years ago. I'm basing that on the paper. Some people say it's 72 million years ago. But in any event, it's within about 10 million years of the end of dinosaurs' reign. So it's a pretty derived dinosaur. It's also in the same formation as 
as Shri Devi, which we talked about recently, that velociraptor-sized raptor with bigger claws. So they lived alongside each other. Yes. I don't think Shri would have been any threat at all to the Sankylosaur, given mm-hmm. the amount of armor and how big it was. Well, maybe when it was a baby. Maybe. That is true. But even then, I don't know. <laughs> they just come out as tanks. <laughs> yeah. It was, though, in the formation that probably did have Tarbosaurus or at least some other large Tyrannosaurid because Tarbosaurus is known from about 70 million years ago. So if this is like 75 to 72, it could have been there or else something that would evolve into or is a relative of Tarbosaurus was probably around. And I'm guessing that would have been the main threat to this ankylosaur. Mm -hmm. Because most of the other stuff we know is like oviraptors and like little dromaeosaurs and stuff. And there's just nothing to worry about. It's like, why would this have so much armor? (laughs) That was the only stuff around. So it's kind of like how in North America it was T-Rex versus Triceratops. Or T-Rex versus ankylosaurus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the same kind of thing. But I don't think we've specifically, I couldn't find an actual find of Tarbosaurus in this formation definitively. So we're not entirely sure if they coexisted. There are also three known ankylosaurids from the Barun Goyat. There's Cycania, Tarkia, and Zarapelta. That's interesting. That's a lot of ankylosaurs. It is, yeah. They must have very different skulls. They do, yeah. So Tarkia and Cycania are those two, the the pretty one and mm-hmm. the brainy one. They're kind of a famous duo that mm-hmm. were named together. And they do definitely have different skulls. Zara Pelta was named just a few years ago. And that was one that I think Victoria Arbor named that was originally not named. And then she was like, oh, no, this is a different enough skull. We should give it a name. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, out of those three, we only have some of Cycania's skeleton. And there are a lot of differences So they have different osteoderms, they have different bone proportions, there are more ribs fused in the back of Cycania than there are in this unnamed ankylosaur, and lots of other little differences, way more differences than you need to name a new dinosaur. Mm -hmm. But since we don't have Tarkia or Zarapeltas, it could be one of those two, or it could be something new. Oh, okay, yeah, because we just have the skull in those cases, and in this case, we just have the body. And it's hard to match them up. Exactly. So we can say it's not Cycania, but that's it. <laughs> why, I wonder why there were so many different ankylosaurs roaming around together. I don't know, but it might be part of the reason I like Mongolian dinosaurs so much. <laughs> because there's so many of these. <laughs> so many ankylosaurs. Yeah, it's really cool. They describe this new ankylosaur's posture as a resting posture that it fossilized basically in a resting position with all four of its legs folded under its body. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And so they say it perished in situ, quote, possibly due to famine, dust, storms, or any other possible number of reasons, end quote. So it kind of <laughs> it kind of sat down. Maybe it was exhausted from hunger or trying to protect itself or some kind of thing, but it just it purposely sat down. It's really weird to think of an ankylosaur folding its legs under its body. <laughs> I don't know why. I mean, of course, they would rest somehow. <laughs> I I always imagined ankylosaurs going into this kind of position when something's trying to attack it. Mm-hmm. For some reason in like documentaries and stuff, when they're getting attacked, they're always like up erect as possible and then like swinging their tail and trying to spin around. Mm-hmm. And then if the dinosaur, other dinosaur gets around to their side, they're just like a vulnerable target. But if I was an ankylosaur, that's the time when I drop down. Well, it could be depending if you're trying to go for the offense or the defense. If you're going on the defensive, you drop down. But if you're trying to shoo them away, you want to use your tail, and you probably can't do that when you're sitting. Yeah, that's a good point. But if they get to a position where they're clearly, you're vulnerable, mm-hmm. like I feel like that's when you go defense mode, right. plop then, down. Then it's like a snail or a turtle that way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and to that point, it had very large spiky osteoderms running down its sides, much like Zool. Really big spikes. They look awesome. It's only the fourth ankylosaur it found with in situ osteoderms on its side, Mm -hmm. according to the authors. I don't think they included Zool Zool in that list, though, which is kind of weird. Maybe they weren't because it was sort of flattened. Mm -hmm. Maybe that doesn't count as fully in situ, whereas this one's a little more 3D preserved. But it looks so cool. All of the osteoderms are big and spiky down its sides. 
and then they're kind of swept back a little bit. So they have this cool curve to them, especially the ones by the hips are like really curved backwards. Hmm. It's really neat. I think it's a stylish ankylosaur, I would say. (laughs) Trendy. (laughs) Yeah. And it's also really big. So the area of the block, which is bone with not even including the osteoderms on the sides, just like the bony part of it is 203 centimeters long and 129 centimeters wide or six foot eight long by four foot three wide. And that's basically from like a little bit closer to the middle of the body than the neck Mm -hmm. and shoulders and a little bit closer to the middle than the hips. So it's like maybe two thirds to three quarters of the length is six feet <laughs> Wow! of the bulky middle part. And that mm-hmm. doesn't include the tail or the head. The tail especially would add length. Yes. So they think with its big spiky osteoderms in position on its sides, it would have easily been over seven feet or two meters plus wide. <laughs> and that's without any keratin coverings on the osteoderms either, which could make those osteoderms like significantly bigger mm-hmm. and spikier and scarier. And... In length, it would have been about six and a half meters, including that tail, which is over 20 feet. So wow. it's a big, big do, ankylosaur. Do they know if this was an adult? They, they didn't specify in the paper. Um, I don't think they did histology on it to test. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. But that's a really good question because usually when we find ankylosaurs, I don't even consider that question. Mm-hmm. Because they're so giant already. And, and it's just the skull a lot of times. You're not going to cut into the skull and hope to find a lag oh, or something. Yeah, true. Because the skulls are just not great for figuring out the age of a dinosaur. But since we have a good humerus with this one, they should probably slice into it and see what they can find. Maybe they'll do further research. I'm sure, yeah. I should point out, not all ankylosaurids have this big spiky armor. They're not all like Zool and this unnamed ankylosaur. There's another Asian ankylosaur named MPC-11305. Not to be confused with this one, which is... 1359. There's also a D earlier in it. But 1305 has flat oval osteoderms on its side. And actually, they did this over like a view from above comparing Mm -hmm. different ankylosaurids. And its osteoderms on its side are so small, I didn't even notice them in the picture until I looked at the key. And it was like, this picture means it's got small osteoderms. I was like, oh, yeah, there are little tiny compared to these huge spikes (laughs) on this one. Yeah, so they're not all like this. And so maybe in the future, you, we might be able to use details like this to name a genus or at least find out more about it. But at this point, we have to base it on the head. So with that six and a half meter length, part of that is they presume the tail might be longer in this dinosaur than it is in some of the North American ones. In general, some of the Asian ankylosaurids had longer tails And they also have a more rigid body. Hmm. So the authors think there might be some link between those two, like maybe the high rigidity of its torso helped to function as a buttress, as they call it, for the longer tail. Basically, you know, if you have a stiff body, it helps you to hold something up. It's easier to hold up something stiff Mm -hmm. than it is to hold up something soft. If you ever try to carry a a 50-pound dumbbell versus trying to carry like a 50 pound sack of potatoes or something (laughs) you know the difference how like the rigidity makes it easier to hold something up so yeah that's one possible reason it had those ossified tendons along its trunk was to support a longer tail but unfortunately we didn't find that so we can't really see that for sure but another possible reason is that it had a stronger trunk for digging Mm. and i love this part of it so we know, oh, that's the headline I remember reading, the digging dinosaur. Yeah. So we know that it was probably good at digging because there are a few key features you look for when an animal's digging. The number one thing is really strong arms. Mm-hmm. And it does seem to have a big humerus, really big muscle attachment points on that humerus in just the right way where it would be for a digging motion, presumably. Then in addition to that, you've got the rigidity of the skeleton, that might help it with digging as well. Apparently, a lot of modern animals that dig a lot have some rigidity to their trunk so that it doesn't fight them while they're trying to dig, just like birds when they're trying to flap. Mm -hmm. I guess when you're moving your limbs a lot, it's nice to have a rigid torso. But unfortunately, their claws aren't scoop-like, like like you see on an armadillo or a lot of, you know, anteater, a lot of these animals that are known for digging. They tend to have these big scoopy (laughs) claws. But this ankylosaur doesn't have that. 
However, the authors say that the whole hand, if you look at the hand as a whole, because we have a really good preserved hand along with the arms and legs and everything, it looks like it could function as a trowel. Oh. It has like, sort of like I'm thinking about some of the sauropods where we think their back feet Mm -hmm. and their claws could sort of like fold over and they could use it as a unit to scrape, even though the individual claws don't look like they'd be useful for digging. As a whole functional unit, it might have been useful for digging, at least in soft substrate. It might not have been as good as hard in hard substrate, but in soft substrate, it'd probably be pretty good. And it was presumably a sandy environment it was living in. So sand is soft. Right. (laughs) I wonder if uh, they dug for nests the way some sauropods did. Yeah, I, I'm really interested in that, too, because I don't think we know much about ankylosaur eggs mm-hmm. and whether or not they were porous and likely buried or if they were likely on the surface of the ground. I would think as an ankylosaur, it would be kind of hard to incubate an egg. Like, I just can't imagine such a large, heavy animal squatting down on an egg. It just seems weird that that would have. It seems more likely that they would dig and bury eggs. So that could be one reason why they did it. The authors, I don't even think mentioned that, but that's a really good point. The authors did mention that they don't think the ankylosaur lived underground. I never even considered that. (laughs) They'd have to dig really (laughs) big holes. Yes, but I love the idea of an ankylosaur living underground. Like a badger. Yeah, but like a badger with a long, stiff tail. (laughs) And, you know, they're saying that a long, stiff tail is not the kind of thing you tend to see in Mm -hmm. animals that live underground. They tend to not have much of a tail at all, because if you're trying to maneuver in tight spaces, you know, being this big, long, rigid creature isn't the greatest. But I would say it's not impossible, because the main piece of evidence that they say is like, we've never found a confirmed ankylosaurid underground nest right but like you you've never found it until you find it yeah you know yeah who knows and there were apparently large ground sloths that lived underground and have sort of similar hands to this ankylosaur weird yeah (laughs) so large i mean bears live underground sometimes they dig out big holes and live underground yeah so it's, yeah, I, I love the idea of a underground dwelling at Kyle's or even though I recognize it is unlikely. It's possible. The main thing you need is a way to dig, and we think they had that. Another possibility is that they were digging for their diet in one way or another. So maybe they were digging up roots for food. Maybe they were digging down to a water table to get water to drink. Or the authors point out African elephants dig into sediment to add minerals to their diet, Hmm. which I think they might be onto something because ankylosaurs would need a lot of minerals for all that bony armor they have all over their body. Oh, good point. So if if they're in a desperate place and need some minerals, maybe you dig down and find it somewhere. I don't really know how that works. I didn't look into the whole elephant. That was one rabbit hole I didn't go down was how the (laughs) elephants do that. I'm just taking their word for it that they do it and that ankylosaurs presumably could have done that too if they if they desired. However, I would say the most likely use for digging is probably self-defense. I think I've mentioned this before, but armadillos sometimes dig for self-defense. They don't dig like all the way into a burrow necessarily. Sometimes they'll just dig down a little bit and get their soft bits like their hands and feet and their underside underground. Mm -hmm. And then they leave that really tough carapace exposed and just wait for whatever it is to go away. So they can just do a real quick little dig and then sort of get Mm. partially underground, get the soft parts underground and ride it out. So this ankylosaur might have been able to dig fast enough so that if there's a threat, it could hunker down. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So even if it could just get its chest really low, Any amount that it goes down is going to be really beneficial for it because it already has a really low center of gravity, but the only vulnerable parts of its body are on the bottom. Mm -hmm. So if it could just dig down a little bit, get its legs and its feet underground and, you know, its chin and stuff, like what are you going to do? It's like you're trying to attack a speed bump, like a spiky (laughs) speed bump at that point. It's going to be totally pointless. Every animal is going to give up after 30 minutes to an hour and leave it alone. You waste a lot of energy. Yeah. Trying to get something that's not going to be a meal. Yep. And most of the animals will probably look at it and just be like, well, I didn't sneak up on it fast enough Mm -hmm. and it got into that defensive position. So I'm just going to move on. So I like that 
idea the best. I think it makes the most sense. I went down a little bit of a YouTube rabbit hole trying to find an example of an armadillo digging into this defensive position because I've seen it referenced several places and I couldn't find it anywhere. Hmm. The only thing I can find when I talk about digging armadillos is usually like armadillos digging up people's gardens. (laughs) (laughs) It's like it has way better SEO. And everybody, when they talk about armadillos, just think of them rolling up in defense. Mm -hmm. But there's really only one armadillo that does that effectively. Is it the three band armadillo, I think? that it makes a complete sphere. And then I think the nine band armadillo can do it a little bit, but some of them just dig. You know way more about armadillos than me. Well, they're like ankylosaurs, yeah. so I got to know about them. <laughs> <laughs> the authors also point out there's the horned lizard, which also sometimes dig holes. And they have, if you've ever seen a horned lizard, they look kind of like a spiky ankylosaur. They've got a really wide, like a broad body with spikes on it and they're low to the ground all that kind of stuff. They even have spikes on their head that look a little bit like an ankylosaur head. So they also dig to protect themselves, but they're really small. I mean, a horned lizard is something you can fit in the palm of your hand, basically. So there's tons of things out there that try to eat it, and they have a whole myriad of different defense options. The main thing they try to do is just camouflage, or they'll run away. But the craziest thing that they can do, as a bonus fun fact, is they can squirt blood out of their eyes Ah. in self-defense, it's called ocular auto hemorrhaging. <laughs> oh my gosh. Is that basically to scare away the predators? I mean, it would be freaky. I thought that's going to attract predators, like mm. if you're bleeding. But apparently, their diet includes a lot of venomous or poisonous things. So they're, and it gets into their blood. So their blood smells and tastes bad. And it's like a defense mechanism. And then they actually, they don't have like a gland that squirts blood. They literally burst the capillaries in their eyelids. That sounds painful. Yeah. They increase their blood pressure to some crazy amount. And then they like burst through the blood vessels in their eyelid and shoot that out. And they can go like five feet. I'm like, how are they not having heart attacks and things with this crazy high blood pressure? Doesn't seem like a good idea or like a stroke in the head. You do what you got to do. Yeah, so they do that. Apparently, it mammals don't like it. They they smell it and they're like, that's not good blood. I want to get out of here. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't deter birds. Of course. <laughs> the dinosaurs have been There's wise a reason to this. that they have endured for so long. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the predatory birds, if they get squirted with the blood, they're just like, okay, moving on. <laughs> I'm going to eat you. You've got less blood to squirt at me now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty crazy. No reason to think that ankylosaurs could do this. I don't think they'd need to, especially if they could dig. But yeah, it's a really cool find. It's beautiful. It's published in open access, so you can grab the link from our show notes and then look at it in all its glory (laughs) because it is one beautiful specimen. I'm sure it'll be used in future research, too. Yeah. It's so crazy to me that they found this so long ago. And it was such an amazing specimen. It took this long to get it out and prepare it. Like, they didn't know what was underneath those ribs on the top. Yeah, that happens all the time. Yeah. But, like, they even had most of the ribs exposed. So, it's like you could see that there was likely, like, an articulated dinosaur here. But they did go to the ends, I guess, and see that there was no head and no tail. Mm -hmm. So, the middle of a dinosaur isn't always that exciting. But in this case, I think it's pretty amazing. Well, you're a bit biased, too. Yeah, but it, I mean, it's it's super helpful to know all these details of the anatomy of an ankylosaur because we just don't find the body parts all that often. Mm-hmm. In a different part of Asia, in Ansan, South Korea, there was a dinosaur toe bone recently found. So I guess not nearly as exciting as the entire middle section of an ankylosaur, but <laughs> it's still cool. It's 120 million years old. It's 1.7 inches or four and a half centimeters long. And they think it's probably from the Ceratopsian Korea Ceratops. So the National Research Institute of Cultural Heritage is going to be studying it more. Cool. Well, the Koreans were involved with that Mongolian dig mm-hmm. that got out the ankylosaur. So good work, Korea, (laughs) as a nation. (laughs) Keep it up with the dinosaurs. In the U.S., the Field Museum in Chicago is offering, it's pretty cool, these free regular virtual tours of Sue the T-Rex for classrooms. So you can sign up for different 
dates, and then the museum staff will tell students about Sue's life based on the research and show some 3D virtual models, and then they have a bunch of fun trivia questions, too. And mm-hmm. they say, yeah, it's for students ages five and up. And I looked at their calendar. It looks like they're offering it on a weekly basis for a while <laughs> into the future. <laughs> And speaking of Sue, there's a lot of stuff happening with Sue these days. So Jingmei O'Connor, who's the new curator of fossil reptiles at the Field Museum, is studying the pockmark-like holes on Sue's skull. And uh, there's no, like, official research out yet. It's kind of the beginnings. But she said that the patterns don't match the teeth of other theropods, so it seems unlikely to have come from something other than a T-Rex. The holes... Could also be from an infection. A lot of people have said in the past, but it's unclear yet if that's the case. So while Connor's studying the skull, she's had a handheld digital microscope. There's a video of her her doing this to take high-res images and then look at them and study them. So again, nothing official yet, just the beginnings. But she said whatever caused the holes could be something a T-Rex has commonly afflicted with. That's according to the Chicago Sun-Times. So these holes could be from a sickness or injury based on some kind of behavior that tyrannosaurs commonly engaged in. Interesting. Yeah, you got to get up in there with a microscope for sure. Look for all those subtle little differences because that's how you see the difference between the, a tooth mark and a bacterial infection and all that is the details of just how it looks on the bone. Yeah. There's also evidence of bone that grew back to fill in the holes. So it wasn't fatal, at least not immediately. Yeah. So, yeah, so they'll be looking at, you know, the textural differences in the bone, like you were saying, comparing to the holes in the area around them. But there is no soft tissue, so it's going to be hard to say for sure what happened. Yeah. I'm always amazed at the details they can come up with. But to that point, it was something crazy that happened that it was causing holes in the bone Mm -hmm. and not the skin multiple holes too (laughs) like just imagining the kind of thing that would have to have to happen to me to get new holes in my skull like i don't don't even want to think about that it's not even nice when there's a a hole in the soft tissue yeah i'm sure it was painful whatever it was it's not good it's not good dinosaurs had hard lives (laughs) yes In another part of the U.S., this one's in Portland, Oregon, the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry has a new exhibit called Dinosaurs Revealed. I think it might be a previous exhibit that they've brought back. They've got more than 25 dinosaurs, including two full-body skeletons and animatronic dinosaurs, and you learn about the different time periods and the dig sites. And people can go. They just have to reserve tickets online. I like that they have skeletons in addition to the animatronic dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. I actually like it the best when they're as close as possible. So you can can compare. Yeah. Seeing the fleshed out version next to the skeleton. And it helps you think about other ones too, you know, like because all dinosaurs had a lot in common in terms of muscles and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So seeing just how much meat was expected around different bones gives you a really good perspective mm-hmm. when especially when it's done in a in a really precise way keratin sheath as well oh yeah that's a whole other <laughs> side of things mm-hmm. also in the u.s in st louis missouri the st louis zoo is getting a new exhibit called emerson dinororus <laughs> dinororus yeah it's got dinosaurs and they roar probably some of them are animatronic oh yeah probably <laughs> So they've got, yeah, they've got 16 dinosaurs and prehistoric animals. There's some animatronics, some are stationary, includes Triceratops, T-Rex, Brachiosaurus, and a nest of Parasaurolophus babies. Yeah, that sounds pretty cute. I like seeing the nests. So when you go there, you walk through a trail, and then you also see this staged fossil dig site. It's going to open April 17th and then be open until October 31st, and you also have to make reservations online. So there's another one where they worked in some real dinosaur bones or maybe replica dinosaur bones in the staged fossil dig site to go along with the animatronics. It sounds like it. Then moving north into Canada, in Kitchener, Ontario, the museum is reopening on April 9th, and that includes the exhibit Dinosaurs, the Age of Big Weird Feathered Things. Huh. The museum, huh? Yeah, in all caps, one word. 
They, they really think highly of themselves, it sounds like. And maybe it's one of the first ones? I don't know. <laughs> I didn't read the story behind it. <laughs> But this exhibition shows what we know about dinosaurs today compared to the past. And then they have a lot of lifelike dinosaurs and obviously feathered ones. I always like seeing the feathered dinosaurs. Yeah. Birds. Well. I like watching birds too. (laughs) You know what I meant. (laughs) Well, I don't know. I'm not sure what feathered dinosaurs they are. Could be birds. It'd be actually really funny if a museum said, like, we've got a new display. It's all feathered dinosaurs. Yeah. And you go and it's just like a bunch of pigeons. (laughs) Seagulls. Yeah. The really common birds you see everywhere. Yeah. Or it's just like a sign pointing to like a pier outside. Like, there they are. (laughs) Flying around. They're right there. I think a lot of people would be upset. (laughs) Look how lifelike they are. Yeah. (laughs) can see them in their natural habitat. Yeah. Or you say, like, you cloned a dinosaur and you just, like, clone a seagull. (laughs) (laughs) Here it is. Oh, that'd be such a letdown. It'd be funny, though. It'd be a good April Fool's joke. You definitely get a lot of upset people. (laughs) (laughs) So, moving into other news. Got some game news. There's a game, Destiny 2 Beyond Light, that's going to release a It's called Dinosaur-Themed Armor Ornaments. And the game is a first-person shooter game. And a while back, the studio had a community vote for what kind of armor people want for an upcoming event. And dinosaurs won. Yeah. Dinosaurs are usually pretty popular. (laughs) And apparently, hashtag Team Dinosaurs was trending on Twitter when they're doing their vote. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty fun. So these dinosaur ornaments, it's something players are going to be able to purchase. And they've got three sets. They said there's one that's raptor inspired, one that's triceratops inspired, and one that's T-Rex inspired. And the pictures look interesting. They show the people, characters with a dinosaur-shaped head helmet and then different (laughs) types of dinosaur feet. So like the raptor one, for example, has the sickle claws. But you're still in like a normal human posture. Yeah. You don't have a tail or anything. Right. Because it's... You're still a human. You're just wearing these things. So is it like a motorcycle helmet kind of? Kind of. I guess your whole head is in it, but then you see the teeth and everything too. Gotcha. Your face is like in its mouth. Yeah. (laughs) Interesting. (laughs) I guess that makes it look, it's sort of like one of those old school, they always represent that when it's like, oh, it's cavemen or whatever, and they're wearing, you know, like the skull of some animal that they slayed to show how tough they are, Mm -hmm. like that kind of thing, but with a dinosaur. I was thinking if you made an actual real-life costume based on these pictures and you did the raptor one with the sickle claw, I think it'd feel really weird walking around with this toe, like, bouncing around. Yeah, or you just, like, hot glue it to the top of a boot <laughs> oh yeah that's true that'd and be you better just look weird because you've got a claw sticking out of the top of your boot but well, i think the weirder thing is your head you can see a face inside a jaw but anyway. that's true <laughs> in other game news uh fortnite the game chapter two season six hints that dinosaurs are coming there's not much to tell yet But people have been combing through the files, and there's some that mention dino, and then there's also evidence for eggs. Interesting. Yeah. Wonder if it'll just be another one of those freemium armor, or not freemium, premium paid (laughs) armor downloads like the Destiny 2 one, or if it'll be like some actual dinosaur content. I think it's an actual dinosaur thing because the map is all this like prehistoric stuff. Oh, man. So they're kind of building up to it. I don't play Fortnite enough, but I I didn't realize there was like a wild animal aspect to it. Or maybe there isn't yet, and there's going to be. I think it's new for this season. It would definitely make a, a first-person shooter more challenging if there are dinosaurs also roaming around trying to eat you. <laughs> yes. So in other news, this one was interesting because the first headline that I had read was that there's this chain of stores in England that was banning people from coming in in their inflatable dinosaur costumes. Oh. And 
it's because of this trend that's happening. <laughs> and then later on, another article popped up in my feed that explained how the trend started. So I guess what happened is in Plymouth, England, there's this Facebook group that there's something like 5,000 people, maybe more at this point. But as of this recording, like 5,000 people have joined this group and they dress up in their inflatable dinosaur costumes. It looks like it's mostly T-Rex, but, you know, there's all kinds of different ones now. And then they go on walks to bring cheer to people. <laughs> and the whole thing started when one person, Dawn Lapthron, hosted a small dinosaur party for her daughter. And it didn't start off with these inflatable costumes. It was going to be just immediate family. Everybody comes dressed in dinosaur onesies, which sounds very comfortable. But then apparently her son, quote unquote, nicked hers. So she had to buy an inflatable costume or maybe she wanted to one up him. I don't know. <laughs> and people really loved it. So she started taking walks in this costume and then she started the Facebook group. To bring others into the fun. Yeah. I don't know if you coordinate within the group or maybe just post pictures of yourself bringing cheer. Not necessarily like a flash mob of dinosaur costumes. I mean, there might be groups of people. I don't know. But yeah, it's it's more ad hoc, I think. So they have people that dress up and they visit schools and nurseries or sometimes it's just walking past someone's house to wave for a, a kid's birthday. But the whole goal is to make people smile. Interesting. And then they got banned? Yeah. Well, so, oh, so it spread actually outside of Plymouth to other cities that have said we are inspired by what's happening in Plymouth and we're starting our own Facebook groups. Um, but yeah, not everybody's happy with this trend because uh, Sainsbury's, that's the supermarket, they said, okay, people dressed in inflatable dinosaur costumes are not allowed in the store. Are they knocking stuff over? Because they're a little bit unwieldy. That could be it. They didn't, the article didn't explain why. That might be my guess. It's also when you're in that costume, it's really hard to see Anything except what's right in front of you. <laughs> Running into other people or something, maybe. I don't know. I know from personal experience that, I mean, whenever I wear it, we're making the TikTok videos so it's outdoors and there's plenty of space. But even just like getting through our doorway to get outside, sometimes I don't notice that I've got this giant head above me that's grazing the doorway or I forget that I'm wider or that I've got this tail dragging <laughs> Yeah. So it's really easy to, yeah. If they're bonking into like all the signs and knocking over displays and things. Yeah, definitely. I've bonked into you and you've been right next to me. <laughs> so I can imagine. And then, yeah, if you're trying to carry some groceries or something, it's definitely difficult. And it, with the hands too, it's it's hard to get out a wallet or something to pay with. Yeah. It is certainly more of an outdoor costume than an indoor costume, I would say. Yeah. But I could also see, I remember when the COVID pandemic first started and people were wearing these because that, you know, like if you sneeze in it or someone mm -hmm. else sneezes, at the very least, there might be some additional protection. Certainly not real PPE, but people felt better being in these costumes. So I saw people wearing them into like yeah. Costco's and things. Plus it does bring a smile to your face. Although I, I can't remember what kind of costume it was, but there was a case of an outbreak where somebody... Uh, wore one of these types of costumes to their workplace or maybe it was a hospital or something. And because of the fan inside mm -hmm. kind of spread particles around. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because they, they basically work the same as those like outdoor decorations where they're just inflated or like a, a bounce house. Mm -hmm. It's a constant fan blowing air into the inside. It's not airtight at all. Yeah. So I think it would be a lot better at protecting other people from you mm. than vice versa because it like keeps the air flowing in through this fan so if somebody like sneezes near, near you it's just going to blow it straight in at you but if you sneeze from inside it it just leaks out slowly from like around your cuffs and stuff so you're probably not spreading many droplets mm. i guess that's generally true about masks too but mm -hmm. yeah i guess i'd rather you just wear a mask and not a dinosaur costume <laughs> <laughs> well so at this supermarket they when you pull up in your costume they tell you, hey, you need to take off your costume before entering the store. Mm. And I guess there's a rule. According to a police spokesperson, you're allowed to meet up with one other person dressed as a dinosaur and doing social distance, <laughs> but you can't have three or more people. Oh, just because there's a rule, presumably, that you can meet up with one other person regardless of dinosaur costume? That's my guess, yeah. 
it'd be pretty funny if there was a law specifically about if you're in a dinosaur costume, only two dinosaurs yeah. at a time. We don't want large gatherings of dinosaurs. <laughs> no herds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Interesting. I, I, I guess I could see why they would make this rule. Certainly getting out a wallet when you mention that is very difficult. It's hard mm-hmm. to do anything interacting with your hands yes. from stuff inside the suit to outside the suit. I say it's easier, at least the T-Rex costume we have, you can take the hands on and off. But Yeah, and not you kind of pull the hand into the costume and you just have an open hole right. at the end of the sleeve then. And but you then can it deflates a little and... bit and then it's hard to see. But the other, there's some costumes though where the hands are attached. Yeah, like the Jurassic World blue yeah. one. And then there's there's no hope. And that one zips up in the back, too. Right. So you can't even... The T-Rex at least zips up in the front so you can unzip it and do stuff through it mm-hmm. and kind of wear it over your shoulders like a giant hoodie, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you can't do that with the, the blue one, for sure. But it's nice to know there are groups of people that get together in dinosaur costumes to spread cheer. You just got to keep it to the streets. Yeah. I mentioned TikTok. Speaking of TikTok, there's a new... Well, new-ish... I don't know how new it is. It might just be newly popular dinosaur effect. And it looks like it's similar to Google's AR dinosaur thing that you can do on your phone through search. And you can use it to make it look like dinosaurs are in your backyard or just outside your window. At least that's what the really popular videos have done. And looks like the options are T-Rex and Brachiosaurus. And there might also be a pterosaur. (laughs) I saw some flying around in some of the videos. And I say... This is just what I found because, unfortunately, if you're in the U.S., this filter is not available. I don't know why. That's weird. I'm bummed. I hope it comes here soon. You didn't try messing with like a VPN and like changing the settings. I remember when TikTok was about to get banned, people were like, if you use a VPN and change your settings, then you'll still be able to use it. Ah, That's too much work. (laughs) I'll just wait. (laughs) So it might come to the U.S. later, you're hoping? I hope so. I guess if you have access to it, you can search for the filter Dinosaur World. But you can see other people that have used this filter yeah, and made videos you, with it? Because I can see, presumably, anybody's videos on TikTok. Interesting. How'd they look? Did the T-Rex look like a Jurassic Park T-Rex or what uh, type was it? It didn't take that close of a look. But yeah, it looked pretty similar in the Brachiosaurus too. Scaly, not feathery. Yeah. All that stuff. And giant. So giant. <laughs> But yeah, I uh, mostly dabble in TikTok. I don't, I mean, I'll still spend way too much time watching videos, but I'm just doing surface level things. <laughs> yeah. But with all social media, dabbling quickly turns into hours. <laughs> sure. sure. <laughs> uh, since you mentioned Jurassic Park dinosaurs, you got a fun little surprise and Maybe they'd announced it before, but I was surprised to see this, that there's a Jurassic World Camp Cretaceous Season 3 trailer already out. And Season 3 is coming out on May 21st. They're what? really, they're going real fast on this. That's cool. That's like five months after Season 2 came out. Yeah. Which was within something like five months after Season 1. I mean, I wonder, so these seasons are only, what are they, eight episodes, That's I think? It's still a lot of work with all the animation. Yeah, but I was just thinking like, other cartoons, they, they'll they have like 30 episodes and they basically make one a week, mm. more or less. So they're sort of on that pace or even a little bit slower. And it's possible that maybe they've already made a lot of these and they're just trickling them out in oh, seasons per be, their be. optimizing. Well, I'm impressed because this is considered official canon for the mm-hmm. series and it's going to eventually tie into Jurassic World, which means that there's a lot of collaboration that must be going on behind the scenes to make sure everything fits in with what's happened in the movies and what's going to happen with the movies. Yeah. And to be able to still do that and churn it out so quickly. Yeah, because the the first Camp Cretaceous, I think, ended where the first Jurassic World ended. Mm -hmm. And then the second one just kind of continued, but is clearly before Fallen Kingdom. So they... Since there's a lot of time in between Jurassic World and Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, I think this was like five years or something. Because remember the island like totally goes into disrepair and they need like special things. Everything's all covered in plants. But yeah. You you can't spoil something that came out years ago. (laughs) (laughs) So, but there's a lot of time. So they could, I don't know how many seasons they want to do, but you could probably fit in five seasons Mm -hmm. before actually catching up with Fallen Kingdom. That's a good point. 
but they need to get the kids off the island before Fallen Kingdom starts because in Fallen Kingdom, there are no children yeah. running around. I kind of wonder too, like, did they decide to make more of these seasons once Jurassic World Dominion got pushed out a year? Hmm. You know, make sure we're all still excited and we've got it at top of the mind. Yeah. Yeah, it does kind of feel that way. Because I don't remember them announcing season two until that one got pushed back. Mm. And then we were like, oh, good. At least we have Camp Cretaceous to look forward to next year. Mm -hmm. And then now it's like, (laughs) how many seasons? I feel like they're going to release another two seasons after this. They might do a full five seasons before. Well, they might. And then the last season before the movie comes out might just give us a taste of the movie. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Or if they get off the island get back to the mainland, they could even get past Fallen Kingdom and maybe even past the beginning of Dominion and start to see some of these like dinosaurs out in the wild or something. Mm -hmm. That'd be cool. It'd be really interesting if they ever had some kind of crossover, you know, and you see either an animated Claire Deering or (laughs) you see a live action version of these kids I don't That's know. true. Because <laughs> we there's so far there have been no characters which existed in both worlds. Well, they mention Claire a couple times. Oh, actually, was there a BD Wong version? I think one of them might have interacted with him. Oh yeah. That sounds familiar. I think there was a, a slightly menacing Dr. Wu in CGI form. Okay. So then but somehow to me it seems easier to uh see these characters turn into animated versions but then going the other way seems yeah. like a bigger deal yeah that is trickier because you got to find a human who looks like this animated character rather than vice versa well I'm, i haven't looked up the cast too closely but they're probably based at least loosely on the voice actors could be so the trailer for camp cretaceous season three it's pretty short it's like 40 ish seconds and it keeps hinting at that new dinosaur that they talked about or they showed at the end of season two and it's got red eyes it's meant to be this sinister threat and there's some fire after some lightning strikes so you can see the fire in the eyes mm, spooky Mm-hmm. you always got to have a big bad dinosaur villain it's true and now onto our dinosaur of the day sinus onasis which was a request from dc cassandra via our patreon and discord so thanks It was a troodontid theropod that lived in the early Cretaceous in what is now Liaoning province in China, in the Yixian Formation. And it looks bird-like. It's got the elongated head and then the sickle claws on the second toes. So bird-like with the claws. Not the same as the dinosaur Sinosaurus. This is Sinus Onasis. And Sinosaurus is a theropod that lived in the early Jurassic in what is now Yunnan province, China, found in the Lufeng Formation. But they sound similar. So this one's quite a bit later, early Cretaceous versus early Jurassic. Mm-hmm. And in a different formation. The type species is Sinus onasis magnadens. It was described by Xu Xing and Wang Xiaolin in 2004, and the genus name means wave nose. <laughs> That's such a weird one. Yeah, it's because from a side view, the nasal bones look like a sine wave. It's curvy and it rises and falls. And the species name means big toothed. <laughs> it had large teeth. <laughs> Buck toothed wave nose. <laughs> it's very descriptive. <laughs> its front teeth were not serrated. And it was a carnivorous dinosaur. Sinus onasis was small. Gregory Paul estimated in 2010 that it was about three feet or one meters long and weighed about five and a half pounds or two and a half kilograms. But there are other estimates that it weighed 22 pounds or 10 kilograms. It may have had feathers. That's based on relatives found in the same formation having feathers. The holotype, IVPPV11527, is a partial skeleton with skull and fragments of the lower jaw and partial tail, pelvis, and hind limbs. That's pretty good. Yeah. And this holotype was partially articulated. It was also compressed. Sinus onasis had transitional anatomical features, so it had a more basal skull and then a more derived pelvis and hind limbs. It had proportionately large openings of the nasal cavity that extended in the back, posteriorly, 
and it had a long lower leg, and its foot was arctometatarsal. So the middle part of the middle metatarsal was pinched between the surrounding metatarsals. Yeah, it's pretty common with uh, some of these derived fast-running dinosaurs. Yes. So Sinusonasus was probably a fast runner. The femur is about five and a half inches or 14 centimeters long. <laughs> I'm not used to femurs being measured in centimeters. I'm used to like meters and tens of inches. Yep. Well, it's a small dinosaur. <laughs> yeah. And it had a long neck of the thigh bone that's between the femoral head and shaft. It also had a relatively short head, which was about 77% the length of the thigh bone. Yeah, that's a, something I ran into earlier when I was looking at tyrannosaurids. Actually, it's in my fun fact. The ratio of skull length to thigh bone length, or in other words, femur length, mm -hmm. which I hadn't thought of before. But a lot of times they're kind of close, like this one's 77%. It sounds funny to think of it that way, but dinosaurs have pretty long heads. Yeah, I hadn't, well, I don't remember running across this kind of measurement before. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, from a side view, sinus onasis had an extra opening, the fenestra, or fenestrae, in the front outer side of the upper jaw, and its tail probably had about 30 vertebrae. The chevrons, the bony arch on the tail vertebrae, at the end of the tail were very long, and they would have fit together to form a plate on the bottom or underside of the tail. A plate? Yeah. So this... Huh tail might have helped it to counterbalance and help it while running. Must have been stiff. Yeah, in the paleo art, it looks kind of stiff. It looks like, a, well, in one of the pictures, it almost looks like a leaf at the end of the tail. Hmm. Leaf-shaped tail? Yeah. <laughs> so sinus onasis was thought to come from this rapid evolutionary change from a group that originated in the Cretaceous and not from Troodontids. And not, as previously thought, from troodontids developing earlier in the Jurassic. So it's not as, like, much of a basal troodontid. Well, it's got the derived pelvis and hind limbs. So it might show also the possibility of modular evolution in troodontids, where certain parts evolved, because it still had the basal skull. And our fun fact of the day is that there is a nanotyrannus equivalent of Tarbosaurus. Oh, just as controversial? It is not. Hmm. So, But just like how Nanotyrannus was named as a small tyrannosaur and then now today is usually considered to be a juvenile tyrannosaurus, the dinosaur Shanshanosaurus is considered to be a juvenile Tarbosaurus. So Shanshanosaurus is like Nanotyrannus mm -hmm. in that analogy. Mm -hmm. But I haven't seen any controversy about Shanshanosaurus. In fact, the person who named Shanshanosaurus later basically wrote a paper that was like, yeah, this is probably a different, it's just a juvenile other Tyrannosaur, probably Tarbosaurus. Interesting. Yeah. So Tarbosaurus, for a little background, was named in 1955 from southern Mongolia, whereas Shanshanosaurus wasn't named until 22 years later, and it was named from northwest China. And then obviously, since Tarbosaurus was named first, it gets the naming priority so if anybody ever decides that these are actually the same genus, then the name goes to Tarbosaurus because it was named first. So Shanshanosaurus becomes Tarbosaurus and not the other way around. Same thing with Triceratops will always be around. Taurosaurus is never going to take over Triceratops, regardless of which one's a juvenile, because Triceratops was named first. It doesn't matter which one's a juvenile, it just matters which one's named first. Shanshanosaurus was found about a thousand kilometers west of the original Tarbosaurus find, and obviously in a different country. So you can't really blame them for thinking that it was a different <laughs> dinosaur. Mm -hmm. In the original Shanshanosaurus description, they describe the upper and lower jaws, several vertebrae, part of the leg, hips, and shoulders, and some other small pieces, which is pretty good. It's a pretty decent find as far as naming a new dinosaur goes. We've certainly seen dinosaur genera named on much less and it was published all in Chinese, which took me a little while to track down because the English version of their website doesn't have it. But the original paper is freely available. It's pretty cool. And it's described in the paper as an active and agile animal, which is just like how they describe Nanotyrannus. Yeah. It's the same sort of thing. They also talk about how the skull is proportionally longer and more slender 
than Tarbosaurus. This is mostly based on the upper jaw or the maxilla. It's estimated to be about 2.3 meters or 8 feet long. And at that size, it was the smallest known Tyrannosaurid skeleton at the time. I think it might still be the smallest aside from some embryos, but like the smallest juvenile, you know, like that's been around for more than a couple months. And that's because I believe it's smaller than LACM 28471, which is a pretty famous one. It's in the LA Natural History Museum. It's in that T-Rex growth series. It's the smallest one. It's about two years old based on lags. And it's the youngest Tyrannosaurus in Thomas Carr's recent paper where he analyzed the growth of all these Tyrannosaurus individuals. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think it's smaller than that. I think that one looks longer than eight feet in the pictures, to me at least. So maybe this one is about two years or younger, I would say, Shanshanosaurus. The Los Angeles Specimen 2 was also originally given its own name of Stygivenator, yeah. Molneri, and then that was later synonymized to T-Rex. So there's another <laughs> one that was a juvenile, and then it got its own name. And also that specimen by some is considered to be a small nanotyrannus because it's smaller than the holotype of nanotyrannus. So there's still an argument. All the ones that are related to T-Rex seem to be more controversial than the Tarbosaurus ones. Maybe because T-Rex is so much more popular. Yeah, I think so. And the nanotyrannus thing just muddies the water so much. In 2001, Dong Jiming and Philip Curry reanalyzed Shanshanosaurus and found that it was a juvenile and likely an existing taxon, as they put it. Mm. They didn't actually name it as a Tarbosaurus, but they said that it was likely Tarbosaurus because that's the other big Tyrannosaur we know from the area. They also mentioned, quote, young Tyrannosaurids had long, low skulls, huge pubic boots, and well-developed limb joints, end quote which sounds a lot like Nanotyrannus as well. Yeah. Dong Jiming was the original author of Shanshanosaurus, which is why I said, like, the original author basically later said, yeah, this is probably just an existing genus. He also named another Tyrannosaur in China. This one's even farther away <laughs> in the southeast in Henan, China, but this time he named a new species within Tyrannosaurus, so he didn't name a new genus. He named it Tyrannosaurus Luan Chuan Ensis. And unfortunately, though, that was only based on five teeth. Oh, wow. I wonder if that confuses things because sometimes there's confusion around Tarbosaurus and Tyrannosaurus already. Yeah. So he thought that the teeth looked more like North American Tyrannosaurid teeth than Asian Tyrannosaurid teeth. And they were extremely well-preserved teeth, which I guess is why he thought it was reasonable to name a new species off of it, even though I say don't name new species off of just teeth. <laughs> <laughs> they did. But now it's generally considered to be Tarbosaurus batar. So the species is gone, and that's the regular type species of Tarbosaurus. So I guess in this case, they were sort of confusing Tarbosaurus and T-Rex because they thought it looked more like a T-Rex tooth mm -hmm. than a Tarbosaurus tooth. But now it's usually called a Tarbosaurus tooth, Tarbosaurus batar. Although I'm not entirely sure if anyone has officially synonymized these teeth with Tarbosaurus. I saw some references in like books, but I don't know if it's actually been formally written out. I don't know. Maybe people just don't bother because it's just teeth and yeah. But if you're feeling bad for Dong Jiming because he's had two <laughs> Tyrannosaur names taken away from him, you shouldn't because he still has credit for naming over 20 valid genera, one of the most names, one of the most prolific valid genera dinosaur namers. <laughs> it's hard to phrase this, yeah. but he's named some of the most dinosaurs of anybody. Cool. Including he has Sinraptor Dongai is named after him. So not only has he named a lot of dinosaurs, but he's a dinosaur named after him, which is a pretty cool one. It is. Or maybe it's Sinraptor instead of Sinraptor. I think that happens a lot once you've named a bunch of dinosaurs. You start getting dinosaurs named after you like Phil Curry too. Yeah. And he named several dinosaurs after this one was named after him. He was still active in paleontology when people were naming dinosaurs after him, just like Phil Curry. Nice. So if you're on the, I suppose if you're on the T-Rex, not nano side of things, maybe you could bring up this Shanshanosaurus versus Tarbosaurus just to point out that the scientific community, in other cases, when juvenile Tyrannosaurs have been named, they've been synonymized with adults later when they were shown to be juveniles. 
And that wraps up this episode of Vino Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe or follow us in your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And join our growing community, patreon.com slash inodino. And don't forget to join us for our watch parties. We've been watching Dinosaur Planet, not to be confused with Planet Dinosaur. Even though it will be confused with Planet Dinosaur, I confuse it. I had to double check before saying this. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But it's been good so far, and we've got three more to go through. So over the coming weeks, we'll be watching them. So join us in our Discord server. Yeah. And that all happens if you join at patreon.com slash inodino. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.